saints of God, uh, <clears throat> sometimes there's something that we plan, but the Lord is leading in, a, in another direction. And uh, we really have to be in tune with the Holy Spirit. Uh, sometimes we plan songs, but we don't feel in our heart that's the songs we should do. We plan a sermon for those who are bringing sermons, but it's not. <clears throat> we feel it's not the sermon we should preach. And, you know, the life, the Christian life is a life of being led by the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, there's two types of Christian. There's Christian that wants, that, that want to be led by a book, the Bible. And the other types of Christian, they want to be led by the Holy Spirit. And this was the problem with the Pharisees is that they were being led by a book. You know, Jesus said, you read the scriptures. But the scriptures, they testify about me. So it's not a bad thing to read the Bible. It's not a bad thing to prepare songs or prepare a sermon. But if we're not led by the Holy Spirit, it's all in vain. You know, Adam and Eve, you know, when they were in the Garden of Eden, they, that's what symbolizes the tree of, good, uh, of knowledge of good and evil. It's being led by our own will, by what we think is good. But the tree, the tree of life is being led by the Holy Spirit. It's being led by the Spirit of God, which guides us in all truth. So saints of God, it's, it's something that is really important. And as we grow as uh, believers, as a church, more and more God is going to ask us to be led by the Holy Spirit. He's going he's gonna to put us in situation to see if we are willing to listen to his voice or if we want to go to the tree of good of knowledge of good and evil today i want to speak about something that is really important and i believe the lord uh, you know sometimes when i not sometimes most of the time when i try to have a subject to preach you know of course i seek the lord i try to have confirmation about what should i preach preach because i want to I don't want to just preach head knowledge. You know, a lot, a lot of believers, Christian pastors, they, che they teach, you know, because they went to Bible school. And they think that, okay, let me just preach a sermon and, you know, uh, you know, share what I know about the Bible. And But this is not being led by the Holy Spirit, you know. Being led by the Holy Spirit is having a prophetic word for the congregation. You know, prophecy is when you exhort people according to their needs. So I believe it's really important to, uh, and we were speaking about this, uh, we had a meeting with the leadership about walking in prophetic, in the prophetic, okay, walking in the spirit of prophecy, meaning that we should have words of edification for the specific uh, needs of someone. And this doesn't come with head knowledge. It doesn't come with studying the Bible and you know, going on e-concordance and, you know, studying the Greek and the Hebrew, which is great. But there's a danger in doing this. There's a danger of putting the Holy Spirit away. There's a danger of relying on, on our own intelligence. So as I was seeking God, you know, I wasn't sure. Sometimes he, he gives really obvious sign about what he wants, to, he wants me to preach. But this week I didn't have anything specific. And uh, just to give a quick testimony, I, I was laying in my bed was around 4 a.m. and I couldn't go back to sleep and I was meditating what am I going to preach it was I think Thursday and then suddenly I received uh, the word prayer prayer and I said okay you know there's there's so much sermons about prayer what do you want me to speak about prayer Lord like everybody know we should pray but as I was meditating in my bed I almost received a whole sermon just in my bed and then I couldn't go back to sleep and I went and I prayed and the next morning I, I, I prepared the sermon. So I believe the Lord wants us to speak about prayer. And I'm saying this because um, as I was saying yesterday, we had a meeting and this is the subject that came back that we need to pray more. We need to pray more. We need to intercede. We need to pray to pray. So this was really a confirmation that the Lord wants us to go in, in, in deeper revelation about prayer today. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to repeat stuff that's already on YouTube, you know, okay, how we should pray, the Our Father, what is it? I, I want to go in a, in things that are, uh, are relevant to us. You know, all of us are, are in different stages, 
in our Christian walk, in our life. You know, some of us are uh, living at home with our parents. Some of us are married. Some of us have children. Uh, uh, you know, it's, 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 you know, that's the church of God. It's not just one types of people, you know. But I believe the Lord wants us to apply and to speak about things that are going to be relevant to all of us. So the title of the sermon, if you want to write this down, it's, I wrote, Lord, teach us how to pray. You know, this is the question that the disciples asked Jesus. Lord, teach us how to pray. Because prayer, you know, is something that is not done just uh, like this. You know, there's, uh, there's things that, th there's reasons why Jesus taught the disciples how to pray. Because, and we're going to see more in, as I'm going forward in this teaching that when we pray, you know, there's many definitions of prayer. In the Greek, you see there's many words for prayer. There's the word supplications. There's the word intercession. Uh, the word thanksgiving. It's, it's all different words in the Greek. But the main word for prayer in the Greek is proshuke, which means speaking to God. So prayer is speaking to God. It's, it's, not, it's not something complicated. It's just a human being communicating with a divine essence, with God. So with understanding that, you know, prayer is something that can be done to God, but to other spiritual entities, because it's just communicating with something divine. Okay, it's, 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 a, it's a human being Using his soul, his spirit to communicate with something which is above him. And uh, 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 this is important to, to define because sometimes we, we speak about things. And I, that's what I repeat a lot of times is we, uh, we use terms, you know, when we're praying or when we do things. We use spiritual terms, but sometimes we don't really understand the essence and the meaning of a word. So it's important to just have these little definitions to know. Like when we say we're praying, what exactly is prayer? Because there's different types of prayer, but all these prayers, they're, direct, they're directed to God. Whether it's intercession, meaning you pray for some, on, on, on behalf of someone, but your prayer is directed to God. Thanksgiving, you're thanking God. It's directed to God. Supplication, directed to God. You know, and, and you can have also requests, but it's all directed to God. You know? Uh, we don't believe here that we should pray to human beings or to another entity alongside Jesus. You know, because Jesus said that he's the only way to the Father. So the word of God is really specific and clear about that. And I'm making this distinction. Sometimes it's, we can say it's obvious, you know, we shouldn't pray to other people. But it's not that obvious. Some people, they might ask like, you know, uh, uh, I was listening a lot to... Uh, uh, this this past uh, couple of weeks to um, debates between Catholics and Protestants. And honestly, if you listen to the Catholics, they they it seems like they have some good points about praying to the saints, because they say, for example, you know the the Word of God says we should uh, pray for one another, and the saints are alive in heaven. So why shouldn't we pray to the saints in heaven? Because they're alive; they're not dead. That's okay. It makes sense. That's why we shouldn't really, we shouldn't uh, 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 base our understanding in our head knowledge. Because when you try to understand the Word of God with these kinds of concepts, you know, where does the Word of God talks about praying to the saints? But, but some people, they try to make some maneuver just to include a doctrine in the Bible. But did Jesus spoke once about praying to the saints? Did Paul spoke once about praying to the saints? Did Jesus spoke once about praying to Mary? Did Paul spoke once about praying to Mary? So, the word of God is very clear, saints of God. We should only pray to God alone. And Jesus Christ is God. He's the reflection of God. He's the, he's the perfect image of God. So there's no such thing as you know, asking an angel or asking uh, uh, another divine power or asking Mary or a saint in heaven. There's no such thing. Okay. And it's important to have this understanding because we can be confused. Some people, they might give arguments about why we could pray to Mary or why we could pray to the saints. Okay. So this was just a, an introduction about what is prayer 
what is the meaning of prayer what are the different types of prayer this is not the purpose of the teaching i want to focus more and we're going to go more in detail about uh, 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 why is it so hard for for us to pray that's really the meat of the subject so before going there i want to start by saying saints of god that one of the greatest danger in christianity in general is uh, and that's what i've observed uh, with a lot of people is confusing uh, spirituality with ministry is thinking that because we're so involved in ministry and we're doing so many things for god we're and that we're, we're we're you know we're winning souls and and and, and, and praising God, we're, we're, we're working so hard, it's confusing this with being spiritual. You know, Jesus said, when, when his disciples, they ask him, what is going to be the sign of your coming? The first thing he said is, is be on guard that you, would, that you would be deceived. That you'd be deceived. He, did, he didn't say that to the Pharisees, he said that to his disciples. So we should understand that there is a lot of deceptions in the last days. And one of this deception is thinking that spirituality is ministry. Is thinking that a lot of good deeds for God, a lot of ministry activity means that we are in right standing with God or that we are in fellowship with God. Okay? When Jesus addressed the, the seven churches in the book of Revelation. It's really interesting. And in, you read that in Revelation chapter 2. We're not going to go there. I'm just going to uh, 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 talk about it a little bit. He addresses the church of Ephesus. And he gives a lot of good report about this church. He said, you know, this church is a, is a good church. You know, you guys are persevering in the faith. You're, uh, 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 you're, you're, you're doing a good work for me. He has a lot of good characteristics. You can read that in Revelation 2 chapter, uh, verse 1 to 5. He even says that, you know, you're rebuking false apostles. You're teaching the right doctrine. So, you know, this was a really good church. You know, it's not like it was a lukewarm church. You know, like another church that re Jesus rebuked or the church that let the woman uh, uh, called Jezebel teach. It, it, this was not the case with this church. This was a very godly church. But they had one problem. Is that they forsook their first love. And this is, I'll tell you, sense of God, this is one of the greatest danger when we're pursuing holiness and when we're trying to live for God. You know, our relationship with God, like I've already said in the past, it's like a husband and a wife. But what if the husband, he said to his wife, oh yeah, yeah, I love you, I love you. But everything he's doing, you know, he's working around the house, he's with his friend. He's drinking, you know, he's watching sports. And he spends maybe one minute with his wife per day. Oh, but I love you, I love you. You know, I'm married to you. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm taking care of the bills. I'm doing everything. Does that husband really love his wife? Of course not. His actions are showing that he's more pre preoccupied by taking care of, of things than uh, 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 his relationship. There's a story, let's go to Luke chapter 10. There's a story that really illustrates that in more depth. Luke chapter 10, we're going to start there. I'm still introducing the subject. We're just trying to understand that, you know, we need to make sure that we don't fall into this trap. And that, you know, we understand what is really the Lord is requiring from us. So Luke chapter 10 verse 38, we read of a story where Jesus went to the house of Martha, a woman called Martha, and she had a sister called Mary, okay? And I'm going to read from verse 38. It says the following, Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. So if we pause there, we see this is the picture of two types of Christian. 
This is the picture of the first Christian, which is symbolized by Mary, who is in fellowship with Christ. She, she, she knows that the greatest need that she has is being receiving the word of God, sitting at Jesus' feet. But the other type of Christian, he thinks that, you know, serving is the priority. Serving is not wrong. You know, someone needed to prepare, to prepare the meals and to do the dishes. We need, you know, if no one would be doing this, there would be a problem, right? But look at what Jesus said in verse 41. He said, Martha, Martha, you are worried about and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen, chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. So what is the conclusion with that story? We might think that if we're doing so much things for God, if we're involved in so much activities from God, we're doing His will, but this might not be the case. This might not be the case because what Jesus requires from us in priority is sit sitting at His feet. Being in fellowship with him. Just like a wife. She doesn't. The priority is not that the husband fixes everything in the house. and No, the priority is that the husband spends time with her. The husband, you know, they, that they have communion, fellowship together. The other things, they're important. But they're not the priority. But we get confused because we think that these things are more important a lot of times. That's why we... We, we sometimes we deceive ourselves thinking that you know I'm in right standing with God I'm doing this I'm doing this I'm doing this but we need to understand saints of God and I'm emph emphasizing this because I've seen that this is a great danger to lose our first love we need to get back to our first love Jesus said to the church of Ephesus if you don't repent of this I'm going to take away your lampstand so it's not going to be without consequences to lose your first love you're going to you're going to feel dry. You're going to feel that you don't have any light to share. Even though you're doing so many things, there's going to be something missing. Why? Because he came and he took your lampstand away. But he says, if you repent and you go back to your first love, now the problem is resolved. So we need to go back to our first love, saints of God. And how do we do that? Primarily, it's through prayer. It's through prayer because, and we're going to go more into depth about prayer but prayer is the way that God has established for us to be in communion with him and fellowship with him you know having fellowships with uh, the church is good having prayer meeting is good having a uh, barbecue is good but it's not fellowship with God alone it's not it's just like a husband inviting people at his home all the time and saying, oh yeah, I'm fellowshipping with my wife. You know, there's the brothers coming, there's, there's people coming, but it's not really the same thing. There's some things that you can't do when other people are around. There's things that you can't say when other people are around. And it's the same with God. There's a level of intimacy with God that you need that we need to have and this level of intimacy only come when you when you are one on one with his, uh, in his presence. And this is the reason saints of God why it's so hard to pray. And I want to first of all establish a principle before going in in, in in the in the reasons why we struggle so much. I want to establish a principle that prayer is primarily a matter of the heart. Now you might say, you know, this is obvious, brother Kevin. We know, you know, God looks at the heart, man looks at. But do we really believe it? Because the reasons I'm the reason I'm saying that is that sometimes we get, you know, we're uh, 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 we get excited when someone prays loud or when someone looks really spiritual and you know spiritual warfare and prays in tongue and. We think that this is the prayer warrior, right? We think that this person, oh man, he's, he's really in touch with God, man. Look at his prayer. Man, I feel convicted when he prays. That might be true. But I want to show you something, saints of God, that you can pray very softly, even without opening your mouth, and your prayer can still be more effective than someone who does spiritual warfare, quote-unquote. I want to read to you a story to illustrate that. 
Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 1. So this is just a principle I want to share about prayer. It's that God primarily looks at the heart. It's not, you know, the spiritual terms that you use or uh, 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 how fancy you look when you pray, you know. Uh, before going there, I, I, I was listening to a message this week. I was so convicted. I, I heard a guy, a preacher, and he said, you know, sometimes as Christians, we say things and we don't even know what it means. You know, for example, Muslim, you know that they need to pray in Arabic. They can't pray if they don't pray. They, they need to receive the prayer the prayers and have Arabic. But when you ask a non-Arabic speaker, he would say, you know, I don't really understand. Just So it's a ritual. And, you know, we, we find that funny as Christian. Man, you guys are saying things that you don't believe and you or you don't even understand. But when I heard that teaching, the guy was saying that, you know, sometimes as Christian, for he gave an example and it really spoke to me. He said, sometimes we, sit, we sing and we say, Hosanna, Hosanna. And he said, do you know what it means, Hosanna? And then I was, I don't know what Hosanna means. So it's a ritual. Hosanna, Hosanna. But I, I'll be honest with you, I didn't know what Hosanna meant. And when I heard it, I was like, man, there's so many things that we do, it's just religion. It's just religion because we say things, you know, but we don't really understand what we're saying. It's just like the Muslim who is, who is, who is praying in Arabic, but doesn't speak Arabic. It's the same thing. It's just a ritual. So I took the decision. When I heard that, I, I, I said to myself, I'm never going to say again things that I don't understand when I pray. I'm going to speak like I speak to my dad. I'm not going to come and try to look spiritual with a lot of terms, you know, uh, uh, glory, Abba, Father, Adonai. No, no, I'm going to speak like I speak to my dad. And it made a huge difference. So this is what God is looking after. He's looking after someone who speaks from his heart. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 1. I just want to read quickly the story. I'm going to give quickly the context of the, of the situation. This is the story of the mother of the prophet Samuel. Her name is Anna. Okay, the prophet Samuel... For those who don't know, is the one who anointed the King David. Okay? So his mother, Anna, she couldn't bear children. Okay? She couldn't bear children. And every year she used to have a... a, a, a she used to, uh, there used to be another woman called Penina. And this woman was mocking Anna because she couldn't bear children every year. And Anna was weeping. Why, Lord, I don't have children. I don't have children. But it happened that once... She made a prayer to the Lord. She made a prayer, but it wasn't any types of prayer. Okay, we're going to read what's, what, what was happening. And we're going to see what we can understand with this. So I'm going to read from verse uh, 9. It says, So Anna arose after they had finished eating and drinking in uh, Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the, seat of, on the seat by the doorpost or the tabernacle of the Lord. And she was... In bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Verse 11. Now we read the prayer that she was making. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your uh, maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. And no razor shall come upon his head. So I will consecrate it. I, I will consecrate him for you. That's the prayer that Anna made to the Lord. But the interesting part is the verse 12. It says, And it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. Now Anna spoke in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. So this woman was making a prayer without any sound. She was doing something like this. You might think she's crazy. You might think what's going on, and that's what the the guy uh, Eli thought. He thought she she uh, he thought she was drunk. When you read the following verses, but look at verse twenty-seven. What happened? 
For this child I prayed and the Lord has granted me my petition. So this prayer, even though she didn't spoke a word, was heard from the Lord. She only prayed in her heart. No sound. That's why I was saying sometimes we think, you know, oh man, this brother is powerful. Look at his prayer, man. Like, it doesn't mean anything. You can pray very softly, very gently, and your prayer can have a lot more effect than someone who is doing a lot of shara ka ka ka. This woman was not even speaking a word. She was just asking things in her heart. But she was humble. She had a humble heart and a desire to consecrate her child to the Lord. And her prayer was heard. So that's the principle. Prayer is a matter of the heart. It's not about what you say spiritually, how it looks like, how loud you speak, how many hours you spend. It's about your heart posture when you're coming in front of God. Anna's heart posture was a heart, a pure heart. She came with pure motives. It's not because she wanted to compare with other people that were buried. No, she wanted to consecrate her child to the Lord. She said, give me just one, just one child. I will give it, I will give him to you, Lord. And her prayer was heard. But, you know, this other woman, Penina, we don't hear about her in the Bible anymore, like later. What, what, what's happening? She had many children. But, but Anna, her, she, 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 she gave birth to Samuel, an anointed man of God who, who, who anointed the prophet, the, 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 the King David. So her prayer produced fruit in the long term. Because it came out of such a clean heart, clean motives, a pure desire to consecrate something for the Lord. But she didn't spoke a word. It says... You know, the word of God speaks for itself. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. You would think that's not a prayer. You would think, man, you need to declare it, as we say sometimes. But she didn't declare anything. She, she didn't, she, like, how can you declare something when you're not speaking? She didn't declare anything. But this prayer had so much power that the Lord granted her one of the mightiest men of God in the Bible, King Samuel. Coming from a prayer with no sound. We need to reflect on this sense of God. We need to reflect on the fact that prayer is a matter of the heart. You know, when I, I, I saw this story, I was like, man, it's really true. Prayer is a matter of the heart. It's not about... I used to be the type of prayer, I'll tell you, saints of God, to really pray... A, loud and try to impress people when I pray. I used to try to impress people and, and raise my voice and, you know, it's not wrong in circumstances. Sometimes, you know, there's a demon, you can't say, oh, demon, please. No, you need to raise your voice, you know. But, but what I'm trying to share is that when we come in fellowship with God, there's no need for all this foolishness that we see in, in a lot of churches, that people are just, sometimes it's, it's just, it's just, you know, there, there's like a rivalry between people. You know, the guy is praying and the other is trying to pray louder. And it, it, it happens. It happens. So this is the lesson that we take from this sister, Anna. So now that we understood that prayer is a matter of the heart, we're going to get into the meat of the subject. I'm going to spend most of the sermon speaking about this. I'm going to speak about why is it so hard to pray? What makes it so difficult? Because if we're honest with ourselves, it is difficult to pray. It's not in our own nature to pray. The flesh, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is, is weak, Jesus said. But why, what, what makes it so hard? Why is it so easy to come and to dance, but it's so hard to pray? Why is it so easy to respond to an invitation to a fellowship Barbecue, men's, women's fellowship, we're so eager to, but to pray, it's so hard. What's, what makes it so hard, saints of God? You know, to understand what makes it so hard, I believe we need to understand how manhood is made. You know, the Word of God says in 1 Thessalonians 5 that man is body, soul, and spirit. You read in the Old Testament that God told the people of Israel to build a tabernacle. 
The tabernacle was a picture of us because it was there was three parts on it. There was the outer court, the holy place, and the and the holies of holies. It's a picture of a human being. The outer court. You read that in the book of Exodus. I'm not going to go there just for time's sake. But there was a, 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 a bronze laver of, uh, with water on it. And the priests, they needed to cleanse themselves before going into the holy place. It's a, it's a picture of, of water baptism, of cleaning ourselves before uh, uh, working for the Lord. So this is the body. The outer court is symbolizing the body. Now the priests, they used to go into the holy place. The holy place, there were many priests doing work for the Lord in that, in that second part of the tabernacle. Okay, there were many priests uh, from the tribe of Levi in Israel. They were doing work. They were, they were doing things for the Lord. You read that also in the book of, Ephes, uh, of uh, Exodus. But in the holies of holies, this is where God's presence was. It's, it's, it, you know, the, the holy place is like the soul and the holies of holies is the spirit. Okay. So in the soul, in the, in the, in the mind, in the will, there were many people working, but in the spirit, the word of God says there was only one priest that was going once a year to meet God because his presence was there. It was not in the outer court or in the holy place. It was in the holies of holies. Okay. But the problem is. Between the second, the holy, and the holies of holies, there was a veil. There was a veil. Okay? And this veil, the word of God says in the book of Exodus, the purpose of this veil was to put a separation between the holy place and the holies of holies. It was something that God put so that no priest could go in the holies of holies. But this veil was symbolic of something really specific. Okay, let's go in Hebrews chapter uh, 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 chapter 10. You're going to see where I'm going with this. So just to uh, 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 remind you, we're trying to understand why, why is it so hard to pray. Hebrews chapter 10, we're going to read uh, verse... Let me just get there. Verse 20. So the word of God explains a bit about the tabernacle in this book. But what the verse that is really interesting for us is verse. Uh, 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 I don't think it's the right verse. So give me a minute. Yeah, that's the right verse. I'm going to read from verse 19. So it says the following. Therefore, brethren. Having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil. Okay, the veil that we spoke about that was putting a separation between the holy and the holies of holies. But look at what it says. Uh, 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 it says, through the veil that is what? His flesh. So the veil was symbolic of the flesh. The veil, which was separating the holy place with the holies of holies, was representing the flesh. So, to enter into the holies of holies, you needed to rip apart the flesh. But it wasn't done until Jesus Jesus died and, and, and Jesus died. You read in Matthew, in the book of Matthew, when Jesus died, the first sign the veil was cut from top to bottom, meaning that now the access to the Father was available to everybody. But the problem was this veil is, sim is symbolic of something that blocks us from entering in the Spirit. Because the holies of holies, it's, it's in the Spirit. It's where God dwells. You see, in the holy place, there's many priests. There's, you know, in the holy place, there's prayer meetings. There's, there's CFM fellowships. In the holy place, there's there's, there's, there's a, a Saturday service. There's many believers. There's many people. But in the Holy of Holies, there's none of that. None of that. It's just you and God. But there's a blockage. There's this veil. 
this veil, you know, this veil that was put to block people from entering because, you know, the presence of God was there. It's not in the, in the, in the, in the, yes, God is there in the, in the, in the way, you know, in the holy place, but not like in the holies of holy. In the holies of holies, he could speak to you one-on-one. -on -one. He could give you a word directly one-on-one -on -one because you were directly coming in front of his presence. But what is the mystery is that this veil needed to be cut to enter the holies of holies. And Jesus did it for us. Amen. He did it at the cross because it says that the veil was his flesh, but he put the flesh to death at, his, at the cross. So he gave us an access to the holies of holies. So it answers the question why is it so hard to pray? Because we have, we have to go through the veil. We have to go through this veil that is blocking from the soul to the spirit. This veil is like a blockage. And we have to cut it just like Jesus cut it to, en to enter the presence of God. In other words, to make it simple, we need to crucify the flesh to enter into the spirit. You know, saints of God, you can come to church and not crucify the flesh. You can still stay in the holy place where the, all the Christians are there. All the priests are doing their work, singing and playing piano and, and going to the orchard. And you can stay there. You know, you can say it's good. It's not a wrong thing by itself. It's good. But do you want to be that type of Christian? Or do you want to be the type of Christian that goes in the holies of holies and meets God? But there's a price to pay. There's the, this veil needs to be cut. So this is why it's so hard to pray. Because this veil symbolizes the flesh. The flesh, like I said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We need to crucify our self-will to enter into the presence of God. It's not automatic. It takes a decision that you take to enter into his presence. To, you know, to be in the holies of holies, it's not like, like I said, just, just you know, coming into the outer court, washing your feet with water, just like it was in the Old Testament. And then you come, you do the work for the Lord, you evangelize and you pray a bit. And then you, uh, uh, you sing songs in the church and then, okay, Lord, I love you, I love you. And then you go home. You never entered into the holies of holies. Maybe you, okay, you stayed in the holy place, but you're not in, in fellowship with God. Maybe you're in fellowship with other people. But that's why God said to the church of Ephesus, I know your work, but you lost your first love. You may be staying in the holy place, but when are you going to come in the holies of holies? When are you going to take the decision to cut this veil and to enter? The way is already there for you. Jesus Christ already paid the price. He showed you the way. He, he, he Like it says, I'm going to read it again. He, he, he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh a new and living way. This is the way that leads to life, but it needs one thing from your part. You need to die to your own self. You need to die to your own desires. Your desire to do what is against the will of God. This is what we call the flesh. You know, a lot of Christians, they're confused. They think the old man is the flesh. The old man is already buried. He's already dead. The flesh is still there. You know, the Apostle Paul said, there's nothing good that dwells in me, in my flesh. It's still there. But the amazing thing is that we have a forerunner for us. He showed us the way. That's why when we read the scriptures, it becomes alive. We, 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 we try to see, okay, what is Jesus trying to teach me that I need to know and to do to crucify my flesh? I'm going to see Jesus in every situation now. I'm not going to see a person. I'm not going to see something that is coming against me. I'm going to see a situation that God is allowing for me to put to death my flesh. So when someone comes and insults me, when someone comes and cuts me on the road, I'm not going to get road rage. I'm going to say, okay, Lord, this is something that you permitted so that I can put this flesh to death and enter into the veil. I'm going to die to my self-will. I'm going to 
be in the spirit of thanksgiving when someone cuts me in the road. The problem is we don't have the revelation of the veil. We think that we can just go and, okay, Lord, we pray and ah, I'm in your presence. I'm in your presence. But are we really in, your, in his presence? I'll tell you, sense of God, if you don't crucify the flesh, you're not in God's presence. It, it might be hard to, 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 to digest, but if you're not living this way that Christ taught of dying to your flesh, Dying to your self-will, you will never be in God's presence, meaning one-on-one -on -one with Him. You, you will stay there at church. Every Saturday you will be there coming, clapping, dancing. But it's all going to be just an emotional stir-up. When you go home, everything is the same. You know, you're fighting at home, you're you're getting angry in the in the streets, and then you know it's gonna be a, a cycle. You know, that's why as Christians we get discouraged. It's because we're not in God's presence. Because, you know, if we're in God's presence, discouragement will never be there. The, the Word of God says in His presence there is fullness of joy. So, if we're always in God's presence, there is no place for discouragement. There is no place for depression. The Word of God says rejoice always. There is no place for, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, oh brother, I'm depressed, man, and you know... Uh, you know, man, that's, you know, I'm, by God's grace, I'm doing it, but, you know, uh, I'm, I'm carrying my burden. Is this really God's will for you, saints of God? But let's be honest, a lot of times that's how we walk. We say, oh, man. And I'm not saying the Christian walk is easy. That's not what I'm saying. Don't be mistaken. I'm just saying that when we're in God's presence, these things, we will overcome them. We will overcome because there's a promise in the word of God. Sin shall not have dominion over you because you are under grace and not under law. So what is the sign that we're under God's grace? We're, 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 we're walking in victory over sin. We're crushing the devil. We're crushing discouragement. We're crushing sexual immorality. We're crushing evil thoughts. We're crushing gossiping. We're crushing, you know, getting angry, lusting after. We cr we're walking in victory. Now, I'm not saying it's going to be a, 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 a once in a day thing and you're going to walk in sinless perfection. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying daily you're going to walk more and more in the light. You know, it might take you maybe a year to have victory over anger. But your attitude is going to be, I'm, I want to press in to be in the holies of holies. Because the word of God says that if I'm under grace, sin shall not have dominion over me. We need to have the spirit of Joshua and Caleb, sins of God. Some people, they don't believe the word of God. They say, oh, you know, this is just how I am. You know, I'm, you know this, this is how I am. You know, I'm, this, you know pray, pray for me. You know. Out of 12 spies that God sent, only two had the boldness to believe in the word of God. And I believe personally, this is the, this is, this is the same proportion in the church. It's very few that are going to believe things that, you know, uh, 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 do everything without murmuring and grumbling. Do you, do you believe God can give you the grace to do everything without complaining? I'll tell you honestly, a lot of us don't believe it. Because we say, oh man, you know, just, this is just normal. This is human nature, you know. Rejoice always. In everything, give thanks to the Lord. Oh, but Lord, you know, my life is hard. People are persecuting me at my job, you know. I'm trying to come to church, but my wife is hard on me. My husband is hard on me. My children are disobeying me. So Jesus is a liar because he's giving you commandments that you can't obey. He's, but the word of God says that my grace is sufficient for you. And one of the signs of being under grace is, 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 is walking in victory. Now, we know this is a process. We know there's some giants. You know, when God told the people of Israel, you read that in the book of Joshua, it took, it says... It was a long war for the people of Israel to take possession of the land. 
these people in the land of Canaan, of uh, these giants, they, they, they're a picture of sins, of, of, of things that, are, that have been ruling in your life for so long. Anger, you know, sexual thoughts, discouragement, depression. They, they're giants because before we were saved, you know, this used to be our, our natural way of living. But God says, he says, go and take possession of these giants. Look at this, this anger. I know you're getting angry every day. You're getting irritated. You're complaining. But with my spirit, everything is possible. With my spirit, I will give you what you need to take possession of the land of Canaan. But saints of God, we need to believe the word of God. So this is... This is what this is the first reason why it's so hard to pray. Is that is it, it's it's because we don't want to crucify the flesh. We we want to live a Christian life that is just you know I'm I'm just doing my duties of coming to church and you know I'm coming to the meetings and um, you know you know you know I'm always amazed how many Christians show up to barbecues. So many Christians they show up to barbecues, but but. When did you say, oh, brother, you want to come pray? Oh, man, you know, you know I'm, I'm working. And, but, but the same Christian, they were driving an hour to go to uh, uh, Ontario, right? Yeah. That's right. That's right, Brother Max. The same Christian, they were driving an hour. Why? Because they, they're more eager for physical food. They're eager for, for things that are not lasting. They want to stay just there in the holy place. They don't want to. They don't want to go through this new and living way, which is the veil. They don't want to partake in that because it, den it it requires a sacrifice. It requires from you to deny your will. You know, sometimes we think that Jesus had it easy on him. We think that you know Jesus prayed and oh, but that's Jesus. But Jesus had to deny his will too. Jesus had a will that was opposite to the will of God. You know, did you know that as a human being, he had a will that was coming against his father's will? We see that when he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. It says, Jesus was praying and he said, Father, if you can, you know, I don't want to go to the cross, paraphrasing. Make this cup pass away. But not my will, but your will. So he had a will that was coming in opposition with the will of the Father. That's why Jesus can be an example for us. We have a high priest that, 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 that had the same uh, temptation than us because he had his own will to do, to go against God's will. But what did he do? He crucified his flesh. The word of God said he had even blood coming from his forehead because he was in so much agony. There was a wrestling. His will against God's will. And the enemy Satan was trying to make him do his will. You know, turn these stones into bread. Do your will. Uh, uh, use, your, use your power to gain something for yourself. Do your will. Do what you want, Lord Jesus. No. He denied himself. That's why he said it says that he, he, he introduced this way, which is the veil, which is his flesh. Now we have an example. How can we deny ourselves? Just look at the life of Jesus. That's how we can read the words of God and it becomes alive. It's not just rules. We see, okay, in this situation, how did Jesus deny his will? When people were praising him, what did he do? Did he say, oh, I know I'm the son of God, man. Thank you, man. When, when people were we're praising him because he healed people. Did he say, oh man, oh yeah man, testify man, you know, testify. What did he do? The word of God says, often it says, you read that, it says, when there were multitudes of people, he retreated to go alone and pray to his father. You read many times when Jesus healed people, it says, he told the person, okay, it's good you're healed, but I don't want you to tell anybody about it. Why did you do that, Jesus? Like, it doesn't make any sense. You read up a story, Jesus resurrected a little girl. And he said to the, to the father, don't tell anybody about it. Im imagine that. It doesn't make any sense. Imagine that, man. Like, I don't know, most of us, we don't have children. But imagine you have a child, she's dead. 
and someone comes and prays and she, 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 she's resurrected. And the guy says, that's great, but don't talk about it. What's wrong with you, man? I'm going to talk. I'm going to testify the Lord is good. Hallelujah. Why do you think Jesus said that? Because he was adamant of not accepting, accepting man's praise. He, he was violent in the spirit. He didn't want pride to get just one ounce in his heart. Because he knew if people testify, what's, what's the human nature? Oh yeah, man, now they know, man, that I prayed and this guy was resurrected, man. This, this was the temptation. That's why when we study the life of Jesus, we see these things now. We see how throughout his whole life he went through the veil, denying his flesh, denying his own will. You know, as human beings, we have a tendency, we want honor. It's, it's in our nature. We want people to recognize us. But Jesus, he was adamant. He, he was fighting against this the whole, the whole time he was on earth. That's why he said to people, don't testify when I, 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 if I healed you. So saints of God, we need to go through the veil. We need to take a decision to deny our flesh. You know, Jesus, you read of a story. I'm not going to go there. But let's just read one verse in Mark chapter 1. Okay, I'm just going to show an example of how Jesus denied his flesh to pray. You know, sometimes we think uh, that we need to be in good condition to pray. You know, when I'm feeling good and, you know, I've had a good night of sleeping. And you know, that's when I'm going to know and I'm going to see God. But let's see the example of Jesus. I'm not going to read everything. I'm just going to read a couple of verses. Mark chapter 1. I'm just going to show you how one day in the life of Jesus was. And what did he do to deny his flesh? Okay? So you read in 1 chapter 1. Let's read uh, verse 21. So it says, Then they went to Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and talked. So this is how the day began. He started to preach. You know, he came here and he gave a sermon, quote, quote unquote. Okay? So verse 23, I'm just going to skip some verses. Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you? Jesus of Nazareth, did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the only one. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, be quiet and come out of him. So how, during the sermon, there was a demon manifesting. He casted out the demon. Okay, this was, I'm just picturing the, the life, the ministry of Jesus, like one day in the life of Jesus. Then you read from uh, verse 29. So now, as soon as they had come out of the synagogue, so after the meeting, after the Saturday service, okay, after they come out from the synagogue, it says, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John, but Simon's wife's mother lay sick with a fever. And then verse 31, so he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up immediately and the fever left her. So he preached at the synagogue, casted out demons. After the meeting, he went to Peter's house. He, 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 he healed the mother. So, so this was a busy day, okay? And then you read after in verse, in verse 32, it says, it says, at evening, so later that night, after service, after casting out demons, after going to Pe uh, Peter's mother's uh, mother-in-law, after service, at evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. Then he healed many who were sick and ver with various diseases and cast out many demons. So after this day of ministry, Preaching, casting out demons, going to Peter's house. Later at night, it's no rest. He went and the whole city was in front of his house. You know, Capernaum, if you made if you make a little research, it's around it was a town of around a thousand people. So imagine a thousand people in front of the house of Jesus. They all wanted to receive prayer. It must have took a long time to pray for all these people. It says the whole city was in front of his house. I'm guessing, you know, this is not what the Bible says, just a guess. Maybe at least three hours, three, four hours to pray for around a thousand people. Okay, so Jesus pro probably went to, ba uh, to bed late this day. This was a hard day. Like, he was laboring hard. 
he did a sermon, then there was demons, then after he went to someone's house to pray for her, and there was no car, he was not like, a, no, he was walking. He went to someone's house, prayed, and then the evening, people came in front of him, Lord, I need prayer, I need prayer, a thousand people, I need prayer, I need prayer, I, my child is sick, this, 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 I need prayer. There's demons, all over. you know, it's chaotic. But look at verse 35. After this day, look look at how Jesus denied his flesh. You would think that, you know, let me get a good night of, of rest. That's what we would think. But verse 35, it says, Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight. So, we would think that Jesus must have enjoyed a good night of rest. But no. He said, even though I worked hard the, the, the last day, I'm still going to seek my father, even though I'm lacking sleep. I'm going to deny my flesh. I'm going to deny what my physical body is requiring. My body wants to sleep, but my spirit wants to seek the father. You think he, had, he, he didn't have to deny his flesh? You think he... He, 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 he woke up easily it wasn't easily it says he woke up when it was still dark so he didn't sleep much why? because he, he knew that the only way in the, in the holies of holies is through the denial of the flesh saints of God if you're waiting for your body to feel good to pray it's never going to happen if you're waiting, you know, okay, now I slept well and everything's good, now let me pray. Nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to happen because to enter in the spirit requires denial of the flesh. When I am weak, this is when I'm strong, the apostle Paul says. Jesus was probably very weak in that prayer. After a whole day of ministry, after a sermon, preaching, casting out demons, uh, healing the sick, people coming at his place. But man, look at, look at Jesus. He went and he prayed even though he didn't sleep much. You know, if we don't do this, if we don't deny the flesh, you know, you have the same example in the Garden of the Gethsemane. You see, Jesus asked the disciples to come and to pray with him. But they got tired, they slept, you read. And Jesus said, you need to watch and pray because the, 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 the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. But then you read later that what happened. These disciples that didn't deny them their, their flesh, they reacted not in the spirit, but in the flesh. Peter he took his sword and he cut the ear of the, the, the Roman uh, uh, centurion. They were in the flesh. They were not in the spirit. Why? Because they didn't chose the way of the veil. They didn't want to deny themselves. They were too tired. They wanted to sleep. Sometimes the Lord is calling you at midnight. You want to sleep. This is the best prayer you can have. Sometimes the Lord is calling you 2 a.m. You're wondering, man, I can't sleep. It's a message. Sometimes you're wondering, 4 a.m., 5 a.m., no one's waking up. But you're still in your bed. I can't, it's a message. The Lord wants you to deny your flesh because he knows if you do this, it's a mystery. You're going to go through the veil and enter his presence. Saints of God, this is why it's so hard to pray. It's almost two. I'm going to conclude in five minutes maximum. I really wanted to focus, focus on that. The other thing I want to say quickly there's a second reason why it's really hard to pray is because, and you read that also, is that not only the priest needed to come in the holies of holies, but he needed to come with blood for the sins of the people and his own sins. He couldn't enter without the blood. The second reason why it's hard to pray is because we're trying to enter in the holies of holies without the blood. What do I mean? The blood is a picture of our sins being forgiven. But Jesus said, if you don't forgive others, God will not forgive your sins. So 
You see, many of us were trying to enter the holies of holies, Lord, and we sing this song, I enter the holies of holies. But then I'm jealous at Sister Megan. I'm entering without blood. What's going to happen? It's impossible. We're singing this song, but then we have bitterness against someone. We're not trusting the words of Jesus. He said, if you don't forgive others, he will not forgive you. If, you know, Jesus gave a parable even about this, explaining that someone had a debt, and his debt was cleared by his master, but then he didn't want to, he didn't want to wait for another person to give him what he owed. And, and Jesus said in the parable, because you don't want to forgive this person, this debt is going to be put back on you. So, so sometimes we think, yeah, my sins are forgiven. My sins are forgiven. Really? You know, the word of God is so clear. Jesus said it word for word. If you do not forgive other, he will not forgive you. Amen. Tell me what other interpretation can you get from this word? Oh, but brother, you know, I'm saved, man. Okay, but I'm just, I'm just reading the word of God to you. If you don't forgive others, you will not be forgiven. It's a serious warning, saints of God. When we forgive others, we don't bring it, bring it back into conversations. Oh yes, I, I forgive him. But then we talk again about the, the incident. When we forgive someone, we're not having difficulty to say hi to the person you know it's not a matter of the head it's a heart issue forgiveness it's from the heart but the problem is we're trying to enter without blood that's what it symbolizes if you're trying to enter in the holies of holies with sin without blood without the blood of christ covering you you're gonna die you're going to die. That's the second reason why we have so much trouble to pray. It's because we're trying to pray. We're trying to pray to press in. But there's still jealousy in our heart. The Lord is trying to deal with the jealousy, the bitterness. But we want to pray, Lord, let me enter, let me enter, let me enter. The Lord is just saying, look, before putting your offering, go and reconcile with that person. Oh, I want to pray, I want to press in, I want to press in. The Lord is saying, no. Why do you think he's yanking? He's given that command. He knows that unforgiveness is a blockage to the holies of holies. It's a blockage. So this is the reasons why it's so hard to pray. And I'm concluding now, saints of God, what we need to understand, and I'm just going to finish by giving some encouragement about how to pray quickly. If you're having a hard time to pray, if you're, you don't know how to start, Jesus gave a structure, the Our Father. He gave things that you can say in prayer. Just follow this structure. It's really simple. It's not a thing that you repeat just for a, a religious matter. It's a, it's a way of dealing with everything that God wants you to pray about. Our Father in heaven, start by glorifying God, singing praises to his name. You know, ma magnify his name. You know, if you have a song in your heart, sing it. You know, uh, uh, our Father in heaven, uh, uh, hallowed be your name, sanctify the name of God. You know, your, my will is that your name will be hallowed. You know, help me to sanctify your name. Help me to be a, a, a testimony for you. You know, I have the prayer in French in my mind. If someone can help me, our Father in heaven, uh, 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 hallowed be your name. What's, what's after? Your kingdom come. Now you can ask for the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, like we're saying. You ask for the Holy Spirit. You can pray for the people in the church to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You can pray for God's presence in, in people in your home. There's many things you can pray. Holy Spirit, come and fill my body, fill my soul. I offer my body. Let your will be done, not my will, but your will. Now you deny your flesh. Lord, I want to deny my will. Help me to deny my will. Help me to, to, to walk according to your will. Show me things that I do that are not according to the word of God. Give us our daily bread. Now you can ask, add, uh, ask specific, a specific request. Lord, I need this. I need this. It's not a sin, you know, to ask God for some things. 
forgive us our trespasses. You ask God for forgiveness. You, 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 you ask God to, 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 to show you truly the condition of your heart. Lord, show me if there's things I'm still doing, attitudes that I'm having to people, thoughts that I'm letting into my mind, things that I'm washing. That, show me, Lord. Forgive me as I forgive others. Now you forgive other Lord. I know this person hurt me. I forgive him. I forgive him. Until I have peace in my heart, I will say I forgive him. Do not lead us into temptation, but but uh, what's what's uh, how does it say in English? Can someone help me? Someone help me. Exactly. Now you pray against Satan. Now you do spiritual warfare. You see, just by that, it took us two minutes, and I didn't say anything. Imagine if you apply that structure and you go in depth. I'm guaranteeing you, you're gonna pray for at least twenty to thirty minutes. Guaranteed. You know, it's not like the Catholic Church where they say, you know, let's just hold hands and repeat the Our Father. No, it's a way of addressing God because God knows what we need to ask. Saints of God, we need to pray more. We need to be in the holies of holies. It's good to be at church. It's good to come to fellowship. It's good to joke and to laugh and to go to barbecue. But it's never going to replace the holies of holies, the sanctuary of God. Saints, do you understand what I'm saying? You know, when you meet God one-on-one, -on -one, you're going to be like Moses. The word of God says his face was shining, glory on his face. You know, the people were saying, man, what, what, what's up with you, Moses? Glory. What's up with you, man? I was with God, man. That's what's up. Amen. I was with God. Amen. That's what's going on. 40 days I'm with God. I, I don't need no one around, no phone, no scrolling. Just me and God. Amen. Are you willing to go in that direction, saints of God? Hallelujah. Let's pray. Amen. 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 Amen.